Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, worship team, today for helping us enter into the sweetness of a day like today. Uh, I want to encourage you, if you're here today and you've got a copy of the scriptures, uh, if it's on your phone or in your hand, you turn to John, the Gospel of John, uh, the fourth book in our New Testaments, the second half of your Bibles, uh, the Gospel of one of the eyewitnesses of the life of Jesus and of the resurrection of Jesus, uh, the Apostle John. We're going to take uh, time this morning uh, to look over uh, and probe what seems to be this just fantastical story of Easter. And we're going to look at the issue of, was the tomb really empty? Is Jesus really alive? And if so, so what? So what? If you don't know Jesus, so what? If Jesus is alive today, what does that mean? If you know Jesus, so what? What does that mean today? And so as we come to the story, we're going to read from John chapter 20. Uh, I always mention this on Easter. Uh, those that are here regularly at EBC know that I usually don't wear a suit into the pulpit. That's uh, Pastor Steve's uh, normal attire uh, for his. Uh, the reason, one of the two things is Easter is Easter. And so I just wear it for Easter. But, but also it, it takes me back to every Easter uh, I had to be dressed up because my mom dressed me up every Easter. We have these collection of slides. Some of you have that that dates me, these collection of slides. You know, those old circular carousels of slides where you used to look at them and come through. Uh, every Easter, there's a picture of uh, the Kowser family, my sister, myself, my mom and dad. And usually there's this rose arbor that's out there that uh, my mom had nurtured. And there we are, dressed in our finest. And, and probably what was hiding behind the scenes was a lot of uh, aggravation, uh, resistance, uh, all those kind of things like that. Uh, occasionally we do have happy faces, right? All those kind of things. Uh, but I love my mom. Uh, I love my mom and dad. They passed on Jesus to me, which is the greatest gift. And they loved each other. Uh, and uh, they sacrificed uh, to let their boy know and hear about Jesus. So Easter reminds me that uh, the coffin where I stood over my dad's coffin and did his funeral, that that's not the final word on Richard Kowser. That I'll get to see him one day. And so that's just a passage in time. And so Easter, Easter changes everything, past, present, and future. Well, let's look at John chapter 20, if you would, with me. And we're going to read through uh, this whole chapter. So if you've got, I'm not going to ask you to stand because it's a little bit uh, lengthy, but uh, we just need to read the story. One of the things that uh, I often run into is that many people uh, in, the, in present in America, I, when I grew up uh, in this little town of Xenia, I went to uh, Simon Kitten Elementary. Now Simon Kitten is not a school anymore. It's the Bridges of Hope, uh, a kind of a homeless shelter that's there. And uh, when I went there, I remember very distinctly uh, the old crackly uh, um, speakers that the, the principal would come over. And uh, in, the morning, in the morning, he would come over, and he would read a portion of Scripture and pray. I still remember that, and I always thought that that was just, okay, fine. We do that at church all the time. I never thought how, how odd that was. But in the contemporary moment, many people have never actually read the Bible. And even among Christians, uh, there's, not, there's very few serious Bible readers because we're a visual culture. We're not a textual culture. We don't engage texts anymore. Uh, we engage YouTube videos, right? So any, any guy or girl in here that's tried to figure out some project recently, uh, you did not go to the library and look up a book. You went to YouTube and saw somebody that you hoped knew what they were doing, fixing something that you wanted to fix, right, in terms of that. And so in terms of, of Scripture, people have not read it. And so many people's encounter with Jesus only comes through other people who may not have read the original counts either. And so the dialogue about Jesus happens without anybody encountering the actual original records that all of these accounts are based on. And so many people just have not read them. And so more and more in the contemporary moment, before we talk about Jesus, let's just read what one of the earliest eyewitnesses said about Jesus. Now, we could read uh, Matthew as well. We could read Luke or Mark. In terms of that, we can read the Apostle Paul, and we're going to read him as well 
uh, a little bit later on. But before we start to talk about Jesus, let's just read what the original people who were on the scene claim, and let's probe their accounts to see if they're credible. Because it is an event that if it is credible, it should change everything in your life. It should. It should change. So let's read it. In John chapter 20, if you're with me, we'll begin in verse 1, uh, and you'll see here at the beginning, even in Christian tradition, uh, how many of you grew up going to uh, uh, sunrise services? Did anybody do that? Uh, I was thinking about that today because it was freezing when I got out today, Uh, and I remember many sunrise services wrapped in a blanket up on top of a hill. Uh, while we were all chattering our teeth and celebrating the resurrection of Jesus in Ohio. Uh, it just doesn't quite get warm often uh, by the sunrise service. But here, right in this passage, is why, is why uh, we uh, have been a tradition among Christians of celebrating the sunrise because it's going to see that Mary Magdalene, she comes so early in the morning that it's still slightly dark, right? It's at the earliest part of the dawn is where she comes. So chapter 20, verse 1. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw the stone that had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand, narrator's comment, they still did not understand from the scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. And as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have, yet, I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples took him Uh, told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. 
Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, the Gospel of John. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the promised Davidic king from the Old Testament, the Son of God, the one who is God of very God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Now, let's review a little bit of what we just read, right? What happened? So it starts off with Mary Magdalene. She comes to the burial site at the crack of dawn. And Mary, we know, brought all of the implements that you would need to, uh, uh, to cover the body with perfume uh, in order to treat the body with love and respect uh, because Jesus' body by this time would begin to decay, so Mary shows up at the tomb, and the tomb is opened. And we know about this tomb that the stone was huge. This was no small stone. This was a stone that would take a number of men with a fulcrum to roll it away from the front of the tomb. And so Mary, we don't know why, she doesn't even look in, but as soon as she sees it, she just turns around, and she runs for uh, Peter and John. And Peter and John, the leaders of the disciples, she runs to them and says, that the tomb is open and somebody, notice how she processes it, she doesn't come back to Peter and John and say, he's alive, he's risen from the grave. She said, no, 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 he's gone, his body's gone. She's not even prone to, to explain what happened. So Peter and John, they run back, right? John bests Peter, out sprints him, gets there first, but he doesn't have the boldness that Peter has. And Peter just goes right past because John halts at the door. Peter goes right in. He looks and he notices something pretty odd. He notices that there's two claws. And in a burial situation, you would have this. You would have what's often called the shroud that would cover the whole body. But you would also have a piece of linen that would go over the head. And he recognizes both pieces are there. And the face cloth is separate from the larger shroud. Don't know how Peter processed it because it doesn't tell us. Then John, after Peter boldly comes in, he comes in, takes a look, comprehends the scene, and then does something dramatic. He believes. We're saying, well, believe what? He believed that Christ had resurrected from the grave and everything that that meant. Well, they go back to the disciples. Mary's still outside. Mary still is sitting outside the tomb. She hasn't been able to go in. She's overwhelmed with grief. And she's sitting there, and Jesus, and this is one of the things to think about, Jesus waited there in the garden to meet Mary. And Mary turns around, thinks he's the gardener, overwhelmed by that, and saying, you know, where'd you take his body? Tell me where he, he, you took the body, and I'll go there and take care of the body. Jesus asks her, who are you looking for? And I think that Jesus is trying to get Mary to believe her eyes. Believe your eyes, Mary. And notice Jesus doesn't even tell her when he responds that it's him. He just says her name, Mary. And at that moment, he knows that person. She knows that person. And it doesn't tell us in the narrative, but apparently she moves toward Jesus and just wraps herself around him, most likely around his legs. And Jesus says, my mission isn't complete yet, Mary. You got to let me go. I got things I have to do. And then later on, we're taken into a scene where the disciples are gathered, and they're gathered in fear. They've got the doors closed because they're afraid of the Jewish authorities, right? They're huddled in fear. They're waiting. And Jesus comes right into that room, and Jesus doesn't, doesn't uh, uh, condemn them. He doesn't attack them. He just says, come and examine me. Come and see. He wants them to come to faith by seeing the truth of this resurrected Lord right here in front of him. And they're overwhelmed. They're overwhelmed. But Thomas isn't there, right? And Thomas gets his little place in the, in the book because we call him Doubting Thomas all the time, right? But in reality, Thomas, I don't know whether he felt aggrieved that he missed the moment, that Jesus didn't show up when he was there. But like the other disciples, he hadn't had the privilege like they had had to actually see the resurrected Christ. 
And so Jesus comes, at least we know, for Thomas' sake. Because he wants Thomas to enter into the goodness of the truth that his Lord, his teacher, is the resurrected Son of God. And so he comes up to Thomas. He says, okay, Thomas, here's my hands. Now, we don't know, right, in Jesus' because of the Greek word for hand, we don't know whether Jesus' marks are in his, in his uh, uh, wrists or whether they're in his palms because hand in Greek can stand for either one. It depends on how Jesus was put on the cross. If he was tied on the cross, most likely they put the nails through his palms. But if he was nailed to the cross and the cross were supporting him, the nails would have gone through his wrists. And so Jesus holds him out and he says, you come over here, take your hands, Thomas, and examine them. Touch them, right? Come here and look at the side. Put your hand right here in my side and examine it. Thomas, stop doubting. Believe what you see, Thomas. So as we come to this story, I want all of us to look into the story. I want to see that John in this text is inviting us to look into the same story. He's through his eyes. He wants us to see and believe, right? And and we can't miss it just at the last part of the chapter. Did you catch it? The whole purpose of the whole gospel, he says right at the end in verse 30 and 31, if you're there, Jesus performed many other signs. Now, signs for John are pointers, right? Signs are pointers. And he's, this, is, this is the sign of all signs is his resurrection. What is the pointer that points out that Jesus is God of very God? What is the pointer that says that he has the power to conquer death? That everything that he said before wasn't a, a crazy man or a liar or some nutty messianic character who thought he was God, but no, he came out of the grave and it gives truth to everything that he said before, Right? And so he did many signs going back from the beginning when he turned water into wine, when he gave the blind man sight, right? When he raised Lazarus from the dead, he did many signs. And now this sign on top of all those signs, he did them in the presence of his disciples. He did them publicly. These weren't private moments. He did them publicly, which are not recorded in this book. And some of them are not even here, but these are written, the ones that I've written for you, that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, That term, the Messiah, that he's the one that was promised, right? We sang about that in our song. All along, everybody was anticipating. And anyone who's unfamiliar with the Old Testament, the first half of our Bibles, we know, right, from the story, and many of you know this, that at the beginning, God created, and then things went wrong for humanity because humanity rebelled against God. But God, in his mercy, stepped in and said, I'm going to send a seed. You can read about it in Genesis chapter 3 who's going to come and provide for your redemption, for your freedom. And then later on, we learn of a guy by the name of Abraham, who's the man through whom, the people group through whom, the Jews, that this seed is going to come in Genesis 15 and 17. And then we get to Genesis 50, and we find out he's going to be a royal character because he's going to carry a scepter of power. So we're looking for this kind of royal figure, this this kingly figure. And then as we read our way through, we meet this character, David, and we find out, we think that David might be this royal character. He starts off so well. David is a man after God's own heart, but he blows it horribly. If you know the story of David, he was an adulterer, a murderer. And it seems like the whole hopes that we had of somebody coming through this tribe of Judah to deliver us just come crashing down, and then God steps in in the midst of David's unfaithfulness and says, David, I'm going to bring a king from your line. You can read about it in 2 Samuel 7. I'm going to bring a king from your line who's going to come on my throne, is going to establish peace and bring wholeness back to the earth, and his throne will endure forever. But when we close the pages of the Old Testament, we don't know who this king is. We thought maybe right after David, it would be Solomon. Solomon started really great. This wise man who was making all these wise decisions. You can read about it. We we even have some of his wisdom in his his, uh, clear-headed moments that he passed on to us by God's inspiration. But then he just became an idiot. Just an idiot. Brought down everything on his head. And we said, oh, it's not Solomon. He's not going to do it. 
And then we start reading some things later on in the prophets that we find out that this king is going to come in very surprising ways. Because we think king, we think ruler, we think conqueror, we think somebody who's going to come in power and bring sub- he's going to subject people to himself. And instead we find out he's going to be a humble king because he's going to ride in on a royal beast, a donkey, but he comes in peace. As a matter of fact, we get even a little bit more surprised because we find out that he's going to come give his life for rebels. So we read that in Isaiah 53 that he's going to come and take on himself what was deserved by those who had rebelled against God so that they might by his stripes be healed. And so all along we've been waiting, we've been waiting, we've been waiting, and now, now, here he is. This is him. And the wonder of Jesus is that he came as this lowly king because if he came as the conquering king and went up to set up the kingdom, no one would get in it. Because this kingdom, you can't get in without being transformed, without being changed. Because Jesus said, flesh and blood, people that are unchanged can't get in this kingdom. Well, how am I going to get changed? I'm dead in my sins. How am I going to get out from underneath the rebellion? Well, Jesus says, I'm going to take the consequences of your sin on me. I'm going to take what you deserve on me. I'm going to come lowly. I'm going to go to to a cross and bear the curse of God that you had earned. And then I'm going to come out of the grave so that you can have the freedom that you lost. That's the story that we are. And John says, these things are written that you might believe that Jesus is that Messiah, that he's the very son of God, and that believing you may have life, right? Right? Now, it's obvious here that John's not talking about physical human life. Everybody he's writing to is already alive, right? We're all alive here. He's talking about some different kind of life. And Jesus has been talking about that all through John, and we're going to come back to it. And if you want a key verse, right, there's two of them if you want to write it down about them. And here's the primary one, John 17, 3. John 17, 3. And this is eternal life, that you know God. It's a life that comes to you through a relationship with the God who made you by believing on Jesus Christ. And then what kind of life is that? John 10, 10. I've come that you might have life and have it to the full. Okay, it's a transformed life. So that's what he's trying to do. So... He is convinced that if we look closely into these events, we can't help but conclude that Jesus is who he claimed to be, the Son of God who took on human form. He has done what no other human being has ever done or could ever do. Only God has the power over death. And if he indeed is God, this must change not only how we see him as a person, but how we look at everything he has said and done. It makes him, in short, somebody to reckon with. So Jesus claimed for himself, these are just some of his claims. We could spend time just talking about each one of those. He claimed to be what we would call the second member of the triune God. He claimed to be the son of God, to belong to this three-person God, to be the uh, member of this trinity, to be God of very God. And this is the way John starts off. He starts off, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, so it was distinct from the Father, but alongside the Father, and then the Word was God. It had all the qualities of God, and therefore he uses the metaphor of Jesus as the Word, because when you saw Jesus, you didn't hear somebody speaking about God, you heard God speaking. When you saw Jesus acting, you didn't see somebody giving you an analogy of what God might be like. That was God acting in the person of Jesus and speaking. This is why Jesus would say to his disciples, if you have seen me, this is audacious. Right? You can read about it in John 14. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. That's pretty audacious. So if this is true, that's what he claims. He claimed to be the one through whom everything that exists came into being. He's the creator God, right? The word, if you want to read about it in John chapter 1, created everything, brought into existence. He claimed that he came from the Father with the heart of the Father to do his will. 
So Jesus came from the Father with the heart of the Father to do everything that the Father desired. And we sang about that here. It's a, it's a mission that not only involves reclaiming rebels who have stood over against the God who's made them, but he's going to reclaim everything. The vision of the scriptures is through the resurrected Christ, all of creation is going to be reclaimed. Everything is going to be righted. One day, disease will be broken. One day, cancer will be a memory. One day, death will be overcome. One day, he's going to restore everything. He taught that his mission was needed because those he had created had turned their backs on his creator. The reason why this is such a celebration is because Jesus came to us, and he makes this clear if you want to read about it in John 1. Jesus wasn't responding to the felt needs of humanity. Humanity wasn't crying out, God, come to deliver us. Humanity was busy, Will Urschel's uh, saying this, running hard the opposite direction. They were busy saying, no, no, I can do this without you. Right at the heart of the fall is humanity saying, I don't need you, God, to tell me what's right and what's good and what's bad. I don't need you to structure my life. I don't need a relationship with you on your terms. I'll establish it on my terms. And so he steps in to go after people who are running the other direction. So John opens with this famous word. He came to his own and his own what? did not receive him. He came, the light came into the darkness, and the darkness tried to overcome it, but it didn't. And he took on, also it claimed, he claimed that he took on human form on a rescue mission to deliver his creatures from the mess that they got into, but they couldn't get out. So he came to do that. He came to take on to himself. The cross was not Jesus dying for his sins. It was Jesus dying in my place for my sins. Right? So we sang on Good Friday, were you there when they crucified my Lord? And the answer is yes. I was there in the crucify him, crucify him crowd. I was there. I was there. He died for the sins of humanity. He who knew no sin. This is how Peter would describe it. He who knew no sin, one of his early apostles, he who knew so, no sin became sin for us. So he came to do that. He came to rise from the dead to give what we couldn't get, earn on our own. And then finally, he came to make it so, this is the crazy thing. He came to say that all you have to do is give up and, and recognize you can't make life on your own Turn your life over and say, God, do for me what I can't do for myself. And Jesus said, I will reclaim you. I will reclaim you. You don't have to work off your sins. You can't. You don't have to make yourself better. You can't. You don't have to improve yourself. You can't. You don't have to just clean up your marriage. You can't. You don't have to go back and write all the things that are a part of your dark past. You can't, but he can redeem them. All you have to do is say, I give up, Lord. Do for me what, you can't do, what I can't do for myself. Lord, save me, deliver me. And he promises to change you and to, to change your present, your future, to give you everything that you were created for, everything that you yearn for, just by giving up and recognizing that you need him. So it's hard to underestimate the claim that John is making here, Right? I've just been working forward, and I've been forgetting about anything that I had up here, so I'll just go, back, I'll just go past it, all right? I'm just pumped about what I have to talk about today. Uh, now, some people, though, when you come to something like this, I, I just want to bring them out on the table, even for us as believers. Um, Tim Keller recently uh, was diagnosed. Many of you know him. He's a, a Redeemer Presbyterian in New York City. He's often uh, writes in major publications, have a number of excellent books, uh, many I'd recommend to you to read. But it wasn't too long ago, maybe a year or so ago, that he was, he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And anybody who knows about pancreatic cancer knows that the odds of surviving it are pretty low. And in that moment, he writes about, in an article, that the one thing that he wanted to go back and revisit was the resurrection of Jesus. Right, right now, today, things may be going well. You may be young. There may not be any health issues. Maybe even relationships are going okay. The job's going okay. 
You have hopes for the future. And you don't want to think about death. It's just a, a specter out there. But I want to suggest that that's probably the rare person in this contemporary moment. Uh, if you look at the recent surveys of the things that are happening, there's an alarming number of young people who are contemplating and have attempted suicide. There is a, a high degree of dissatisfaction among people with life in general. There's a lot of despair. People struggling with anxiety is off the charts. People struggling with depression is on unprecedented numbers. People struggling with just who am I? What is my identity? How do I find significance and meaning in life? It seems as if all the things that used to be able to be the, the solid ground that we could stand on to tell us a little bit about who we are, they've all been eroded. I mean, it hasn't created happier people, hasn't created happier women. Statuses on, on women, on women in particular, is they're as unhappy as they have ever been. So I, wanna, I want to look at the face of some of the objections that you might find to this thing. And, and for many people, they say, I, I, I just don't know if I look into it. And if I look into it, it just, the first one is, it just seems too good to be true. Can this really offer an answer to what life is about? Do you understand, Greg, the darkness of my life? Do you understand my past? Is there really somebody who can offer victory over death in the grave? Is that really possible? Maybe you've been disappointed by all the offerings that you've had so far. You bought into, right, the wisdom of TikTok and followed them. Maybe you've taken on three or four identities and you've moved yourself across things and it doesn't satisfy. There's something inherently broken when you need people outside of you to affirm your identity to say you're okay. You don't want to get your hopes up only to be dashed once again. Or maybe... Right? It's just too much to lose. You don't want to look into it because you're afraid of what, it, what you might lose. If you buy into this, you think this might cost you socially. What will people think of me? Given the way followers of Christ are portrayed and attacked by the media and our entertainment culture, there's nothing good to be gained socially by becoming a follower of Jesus. Your popularity and status will most likely take a real hit. Or simply, you think you won't be able to do anything fun. Right? If, I, if I look seriously at this, I'm gonna, all the fun things I want to do are gone. People who follow Christ are just a bunch of people who say no. Is it fun? I'm a follower of Jesus. The answer is no. Okay? That's what some people think. Okay? Or third, it's just too unattractive. Okay? You don't want to look into it because you don't like the vision of life that you think many Christians have. Many influential quarters of our culture portray Christian men as oppressors of women. Some portray Christian women as empty-headed people who do whatever their husbands tell them. Increasingly, many believe that it's unfair or mean to discourage some types of sexual behavior in favor of others. Christians are hateful. They're even mentally ill, right? And here in a Christian circle, it's just phobia city in here. So that's what many people think. It's just, I, I don't, I don't, that, that's, that vision of life is ugly, right? Or it's too hurtful. Now, I talk to people like this all the time. I was talking with my brother Rick about this yesterday. If you've been around church at any given point in time and you know anyone around this church, there are no perfect people here. And you got hurt by somebody. And you say, I got hurt by that. I'm not going to try that again. I opened myself up once, right? I took the path that Melissa took this morning. Right, Melissa's been with us. I took that path once, and then somebody hurt me. Oh, I'm not going to do that again. I'm not going to. I'm going to open myself up to that again. Or it's just too risky because you don't want to be duped. I don't want to be duped. Right? It seems that like you have to check your mind at the door to be a Christian. I don't want to be someone who doesn't think about life. Our Christians are a whole bunch of non-thinking people. They don't think about anything. Right? They're a bunch of crazy bigots. And so when you have those kinds of things in the mind, I want to bring those out on the table. Now, no right-thinking Christian would deny that you're going to find some really stupid bad behavior among Christians. I, I, I have hurt people. I have made mistakes. I've done stupid things. My wife can tell you there's been a litany of I'm sorry's between us over 38, 39 years. 
Christianity doesn't make perfect people. It changes people dramatically, puts them off on another path, but it makes them own their own difficulties, recognize their difficulties, apologize for them, and lean in on Jesus. Now, Christians don't do things right, but I I just want to say to you, let Jesus speak for himself. Let Jesus speak for himself. Look at him. Don't put excuses up because of the flawed follower in front of you. Now, given the obvious impact on his, of his life on humanity universally and, and historically, and given the possible consequence of getting him wrong, right? This is a, this is a, a tremendous... John's wager is, is that there's only two options. There's life. Okay, we're going to talk about this. This is audacious. There's life, genuine existence, purpose, meaning, fulfillment in Jesus. And outside of that, there's nothing. That's the claim. So it's a startling claim. So let's step in and let's try to remove some of these roadblocks a little bit. At least discuss some of the things that may help us to do that. Now, uh, we've looked at the early witness account. I'm going to come along three lines of things that people have often brought up. And if you go out today, right, on Easter, not only will there be a bunch of Christians encouraging you to think about Jesus is resurrected, there'll be a whole bunch of people who hate Jesus or who deny it or don't believe it's true who are also going to be advertising, don't believe it. So I want to deal with just some of the three, uh, three areas of things that are brought up that people say, this is not historically credible, right? This is too fantastical to believe. Come on, I was a kid once, right? Even, you know, this is not so much true anymore, but it used to be, especially when I first started pastoring, is this kind of mentality, you know, churches for the kids. Churches for the kids. And then once you become an adult, right, eventually you give up on Santa Claus. Well, at least most of the adults in here have, right? You give up on Santa Claus and you say, no, no, there isn't a Santa Claus. And you give up on that. Uh, Most of you believe that your uh, stuffed animals, right? I hope you still don't have them if you're an adult, but you believe you you don't believe your stuffed animals are real people or things that come alive or things like that, or you need them that they actually provide you some sort of protection at nighttime. I'm not trying to probe anybody here, but right, those kind of things, right? So you believe that, and many people come and they think about they think about Christ is like, oh, he's good for the kids, right? Because he tells you how to be a nice person, and when you go to church, right, you know, don't hit each other, be nice. You know, do those kinds of things like that. But, you know, once you get older, especially once you're a teenager, come on. Come on. So the idea here is, is it really credible? Right? Is there something to reckon with? Can it be so easily dismissed? And I want to argue, no. I don't think it can. Right? Somebody asked me the other day, I had a student uh, who wrote me who was struggling with their faith. He's now graduated and on. And he wrote me, and, and we talked about a number of things, and I'm dialoguing with him, got a note back from him the other day that I was sharing with my wife about what he had to say. I was super encouraged uh, by his response. But he wrote me an edgy little note, an edgy little sarcastic, cynical note. And I wrote back to him, and I said, there's a whole bunch of things that I could talk to you about, but one of the things I want to say to you right off, is said, I want to testify to you to the reality of Jesus Christ in my life that he's changed me. And one of the things that's happened over my life is I've found no other way to explain my own existence, my yearnings, my longings, my desire for meaning, my my struggle with right and wrong, that it's it's just bored into me, it's just inherent to me that I evaluate what I do, my yearning to be forgiven, my struggle with guilt. There's only one story that makes sense of my story, and the older I get, the more fulfilling and true that story becomes. So I'm not a follower of Jesus because it's my job. I'm not a follower of Jesus because I, I, I'm, I'm paid to represent Jesus. I'm a follower of Jesus because Jesus has changed me. Jesus has made me a different person. He's made me a different person. He offers me a hope and a purpose and a direction. I study my Bible in the best of my moments because I believe the Lord who wrote it. I pray because there's a risen Christ to talk to. I live with hope that I'll see my dad one day. I live with hope that the people that I pray with and pray over, right, as we did recently as elders, that no matter what the day is today, 
Christ ultimately has overcome the world. I don't care what you face today. If there were no hope that you were just going to suffer and die, it would be absolute despair. There'd be no reason to fight on. But with Christ, we trust not only that he's at work in the midst of our difficulties, bringing beauty from ashes, but one day he'll just beautify everything. So here's three things that we want to look at. The empty tomb, the nature and testimony of the eyewitnesses, and the last thing, the impact on the early followers. I'm just going to bring up some things here, and if you want to note them, if you want more information uh, later on from me, I'll be glad to give it. All I want to say is there is more historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus or as much historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus as there is for any historical event. It's absolutely overwhelming the records that we have. So it doesn't stand out unique, right, in terms of that, but it stands out. Matter of fact, if you, are, if you need something to read that's like a thousand pages long that tries to go after every particular thing, I just recommend to you N.T. Wright's book on the resurrection. N.T. Wright, N.T. Uh, Wright, um, Tom Wright is often what he's referred to, but he has an exhaustive account on the book of the resurrection. If you need uh, more information about that, I'll be glad to let you have it. There's another guy by the name of Mike Laconia, a uh, former student of mine from way back. He has another 1,500-page volume, writes light reading for the afternoon uh, that you want to have. But it goes through everything, right, that regards the resurrection. So let's say about the fact of the empty tomb. Let me say a couple things here. Christianity as a movement could have been stopped in its tracks immediately if the body of Jesus could have been recovered and displayed. I mean, right away, we could have shut this whole thing down. A bunch of disciples run around. Only 50 days later, we're going to find out they're standing in public in Jerusalem saying, this Christ that you crucified has resurrected from the grave. He is the Lord, the Messiah. Well, he's going to say that in Jerusalem. You could have had anybody, and of course, the high priests that were opposing Jesus would have loved to have had the body right, to do so. Christians from the beginning claimed the resurrection of Jesus within two months, right? The Passover to Pentecost. Pentecost is when Peter is preaching in Acts chapter 2. About 50 days later, Peter was declaring Christ's resurrection to thousands of Jewish hearers. All somebody needed to do is produce the body. Notice this about, there's no record of early Christians making Jesus' tomb a place of devotion and pilgrimage. Right? This is normal for other religious observances of the time. We don't even know where it was. It has no significance because there's nobody in it. It's not a place to go worship at. It's empty. So the tomb became inconsequential. But today we have a guess maybe where it was, but we don't know. And it's not important in terms of that. The fact that we have a living Lord is no longer in it. He's the object of worship. So all historians, for example, secular and Christian alike, take it for granted that the tomb is empty. Right, everybody, it's just they have different explanations of how it got empty. But nobody says the tomb had a body in it. Okay, number one. Okay. Now, let's talk about the testimony of the eyewitnesses, right? I want to read a couple things. Look at, uh, take your Bibles and look at 1 John chapter 1. I've got to watch my time here. 1 John chapter 1. Now, this is a, another letter by the author of the gospel that we're in, uh, a little epistle, a little small letter by 1 John. And he's dealing with uh, false teachers who are going around saying, that I believe in Jesus, I just don't believe that he became human. I just don't think he was human. Uh, because in the first century, it wasn't a problem believing that he was God necessarily, but it was really a hard time to believe that he could have human flesh. Because in the secular world, they thought the material world was evil. So how could you have God, who's pure spirit, take on human flesh? That, that can't happen, Right. But as far as Christians are concerned and Jesus is concerned, if he wasn't human, then he offers us no hope. He had to be human to become our substitute, to die in our place. He came to undo what the first Adam had screwed up. And so this is why Scripture will call him the second Adam who came to undo what the first Adam... So he became fully human. 
He lived a sinless life, died on the cross, took our punishment on him, and won for us the life that we could not gain. Well, here's John right at the beginning, and I think you want to get the, you can get it pretty clear that John is hammering on the fact that he was an eyewitness of Jesus. Okay, in case you miss it, he says it like four times. Right here we are in verse one. That which we heard from the beginning, which, that which, we, uh, which was from the beginning, which we have heard with our ears, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and so he goes on beyond, we just didn't see him at a distance, we examined him up close, and our hands have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life, the reference to Jesus, the word of life. The life appeared, did I tell you that we had seen it? And we testified to it and we proclaimed uh, to you with the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have, did I say this already, seen and heard. Okay? And so the eyewitnesses here, John, also, you could, you could read in 2 Peter 1.16, for we did not follow uh, just cleverly uh, devised witnesses, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Now, so what do we find about the eyewitnesses? They publicly proclaimed that Jesus had died in Jerusalem just two months after the event among Jews who were opposed. And in a public document written only 20 years later, 1 Corinthians by the Apostle Paul, here's what he says, right? If you want to look at that with me, look at 1 Corinthians 15. This actually chronologically, is the earliest account of the resurrection of Jesus that even predates in time of its writing the gospel. So here we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, a famous passage where Paul talks about the good news that is the proclamation of Christians. But I just want to look at verses 3 through 7. He says, for what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, that's his Hebrew name, Cephas, and then to the 12, the 12 disciples, and after that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. So this is a crucial issue here. Paul says there are people alive. If you want to go talk to them, they can verify what I'm telling you. So within 20 years, this is no legendary account of Jesus that grew up over time. Within, uh, within days, within months, within years of this time, they are recording and proclaiming this Jesus is alive even during the period of time when the people were alive to have seen him. They could seek out their testimony. And notice here, the sightings were in large groups, over 500. That makes it kind of hard to have an hallucinatory experience. Right? They were just hallucinating, right? They walked in the tomb, and Mary was pretty grieved. She saw some guy. She thought it was Jesus, right? Okay, maybe she was just overwhelmed with grief. But even then, isn't it interesting that Mary's first impulse is not to explain what she's seen by the resurrection? She was not any more... Uh, 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 tend, she didn't tend any more than you and I would to go to a grave and find somebody missing and then run through town and say, they've resurrected from the grave. We would say, there's been grave robbers in here. That's exactly the way Mary operates. So no hallucinatory experience, and it's very hard to think of, and this is one of the, the constant ones, it was a wish fulfillment, is that the eyewitnesses, they were so overcome with grief that they denied Jesus' death, and they made up some sort of story to make them feel good about it. Right? So they told themselves a lie. I mean, this is, this is true from Freud on the way forward, right? Christians are a whole bunch of people that just, you know, they, they, they create a wish because they're, they're people who are too weak to face the idea that, that life is fundamentally absurd, right? You're a, you're a meatball, you're an interesting meatball, and, and, and it may be interesting to study you as a meatball, but that's all you are, and you're going to live for a little while, and then you're going to die and become a hunk of dirt, and you may be significant in the sense that you can live on on the internet for a little while, right? People read about your life, 
or you can put your name on some sort of building, right? It happens over at Cedarville at the campus, and then you're going to get two or three generations later a group of students who come in and don't know you from Adam, and then some other donor is going to come along and take your name off and put another one on, and you're going to disappear, and you go down a couple generations, and your life will mean nothing. Nothing. That's the truth of it. And I don't care how you, you put you know, uh, beautiful words over funerals, in a moment when that person dies, they're gone forever. Forever. Just like that. Nothing's going to bring them back. They're not some star in the sky who's looking down on you. They're not walking around outside. They're not engaging you in a particular way. Where you are, if that's true about the nature of reality, then it's just, it's meaningless. And so, the, 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 when they come to the tomb, they're not tending to say, oh, he must have resurrected. And Christians are people that, oh, it's too absurd. Life is too meaningless. We need something to help us. We need a crutch. So let's create a God and a resurrected Jesus so that we can face how dark life is. Well, what you want to see with the early Christians, that wasn't their first impulse. Their first impulse was to fall into despair. He didn't raise. He's not there. They thought exactly the same way you and I would. It took the appearance of Jesus to them to convince them that he'd actually raised from the grave. So when we think about these ancient peoples, we often put them and say, oh, they were naive and mythological and they would put, you know, a miracle on everything. No, no, that wasn't their tendency at all. And then, of course, this is something that's hard for us in this present moment, is that the early church, the first witnesses were women. Somebody says, well, what's wrong with that? Well, nothing. Nothing's wrong with that. But in the ancient world, if you wanted to verify something, you would not rely on the witness of women. Now, that seems absolutely offensive, and it is offensive, because in the ancient world, you could not have a woman who could testify in court because she was not trusted. One of the things that you find about Christianity that is one of the reasons it speaks to authenticity is that normally when you have a beginning of a movement, it tries to glorify its origins. It tries to make the people who were the founders gods. They were perfect. You got to believe it because look at who they were. And when you read back and you look at the disciples, they're flawed. Man, are they flawed. They all give us all hope, right? All we have to do is read Peter and I feel better about myself, right? So they give us all hope, right? But for them in Jesus' world, men and women were equal to him. Men and women were both objects of his compassion. Men and women were the people that he came to seek and to save because they were lost. And the reason why Mary's there is because historically she was the first one. Right? There's no need to glorify the beginnings. The need is to represent what exactly happened, and Mary tells us. Okay, and then lastly, the thing here, the impact of the resurrection on Jesus' followers. Right Today, right, and this doesn't make it true, but it does make it something to be thought about. Over the, the earth today, there's over 2 billion plus believers in Jesus. And you can't explain them by their common upbringing. You can't explain them by their common culture. You can't explain them by virtue of their socioeconomic background or their education. The only thing that they have in common is that they've encountered the person of Jesus Christ when somebody told them the story of how Jesus came to seek and to save them. Early on, these followers turned from skeptics into martyrs. You know, we don't read about the disciples much beyond the book of Acts, but we know from church history that as far as we know, only one of them of the original 12 survived to an old age, and that's the author of the text that we're reading, John the Apostle. All the rest of them were martyred. So, let's just think about this for a moment. What difference does it make if the tomb is empty? Well, let's start here. Here's what we found. The tomb was empty. Everybody agrees. The body had been there, but it's now gone as the clothes make clear. His body was in it. Jesus appeared to his followers, and they have literally been turned upside down. And I don't think it's too much to say that they have turned the world upside down. As John records it, when he saw the empty tomb with the grave clothes lying there and the face cloth folded in a place off by itself, 
He believed Jesus' claims for himself right then. When Mary Magdalene met Christ in the garden, she believed Jesus' claims for himself. When the disciples had Jesus appear to them in a closed room, they believed his claims for himself. When Jesus came to Thomas in his doubt and let him touch the imprint of the nails in his hands and touch the wound from the spear in his side, Thomas believed Jesus' claims for himself. Now here, I just want to say to you, this is not something that you can just hear and walk away from. You will make a decision today. And the question is, how will you respond? Now, many of you know, and I recommend this book if you're not familiar with it, uh, Lee Strobel is famous for his little series of books, The Case. I think he has a case for everything uh, here, but he has one of them as a case for Christ. And... Many of you know, if you haven't read his story, you should read his story. Just it's entertaining in and of itself. But he was a committed atheist. He was a journalist. And he had something terrible and distressing happen to him. His wife decided to become a follower of Jesus. And he was irritated. He said, when I married you, I didn't sign up to marry some Jesus freak. Right? And he was anticipating how negative this was going to, the impact it was going to be on his life. Well, out of love for his wife and to deal with it seriously, he set off on an investigation to try to figure out whether or not it had any historical credibility. And he thought what many people thought, that it's just a legend, right? It's just a legend. It's been made up and it's been embellished over the years, right? Because he began, as many people do, with, you know, miracles don't happen, right? People don't raise from the grave. That's not possible. So it has to be some other explanation for what's going on. So his basic thesis was that it was a legend. But then he started looking into it. And he set himself off on a search, and he went on a a deliberate search for years and years. And finally, literally, he got boxed into a corner where he could not get away from the fact that it had as much historical credibility as any historical event. Then the unnerving thing is, well, then what do I do with this Jesus? What do I do with him? And here's what he writes. On November 8, 1981, My journalistic skepticism toward the supernatural had melted in light of the breathtaking historical evidence that the resurrection of Jesus was a real historical event. In fact, my mind could not conjure up a single explanation that fit the evidence of history nearly as well as the conclusion that Jesus was who he claimed to be, the one and only Son of God. The atheism I had embraced for so long buckled under the weight of historical truth. I was, it was a stunning and radical outcome, certainly not what I anticipated when I embarked on this investigative process, all of which led me to the so what question. If this is true, what difference does it make? If it is true, what difference does it make? Now I'm gonna invite David and the team to come back up to lead us in our final song here. But as they do, let me just talk to you about a little bit about the difference that it does make. And I just want to say to you here, and I want to say to you as, a, as someone who maybe is considering the claims of Jesus, as someone who's never cried out to him to deliver you from the sin that you have. And I also want to speak to you if you're a follower of Jesus. And you followed him maybe for years by this time. Do you dare stay on the fence about Jesus? Do we have any real reason to doubt who he is? And if there is any reason, is there any reason why we would not trust him to tell us who we are and what we need? I can believe him when he tells me that my struggles in life are due to my separation from him. That's what he says. The struggles you have are not your boss, your neighbor, the disease you have, the culture that you live in, the parents you have. That's not the source of the deep angst and and pain and guilt and suffering that you have. It's tied to where you are in relationship to him. Those are all symptoms on the outside. I can believe him that I nor anything else other than him can deliver me from the mess I'm in. There's only been one person who's gone through the grave and come out the other side who's an authority on death. 
I can believe him that his death made it possible to come out from under the consequences of my rebellion against him. If you want to look at Jesus and you want to wonder, I don't care how difficult your life is, if you want to wonder how much does he love me, well, then you can go to the cross and you can sit right there and it's that much. How much power does he have to deliver me? Then you go sit right at the empty tomb. It's that kind of power. It's that kind of power. I can believe him that he has the power to transform me and that he has the right, the right and the wisdom to guide me. The question was, is will we believe him? Let's sing David.